Our governments are often criticized for their inability to effectively execute large infrastructure projects. The United States has recently announced a federal infrastructure plan that promises to allocate more than a trillion dollars towards upgrading and repairing infrastructure throughout the country. However, this initiative is already facing criticism from individuals who doubt its ability to address the nation's failing infrastructure. Similar skepticism is often directed towards smaller projects, which tend to be marred by delays and significant cost overruns. This is unfortunate because investing in infrastructure can be one of the most worthwhile actions a government can take. In the short term, infrastructure spending acts as a stimulus, creating jobs for laborers, engineers, city planners, and environmental consultants. This not only provides much needed income for people, but also helps to reduce unemployment rates. Unlike a stimulus check, infrastructure spending leads to the creation of valuable assets that can benefit the economy for years to come. In the distant future, even after the effects of the regular stimulus payments have faded, there will be long-lasting results from projects like the Hoover Dam, which was constructed in part to provide jobs during the Great Depression. Today, almost a century later, the dam still serves as a reservoir and electricity infrastructure. Investment in infrastructure is undeniably important. In addition to the economic benefits, infrastructure spending is also more politically acceptable as it's not viewed as a handout. The paychecks that workers receive on these projects are seen as a fair exchange for their labor, and the resulting infrastructure often generates clean energy or reduces the amount of time spent commuting. Overall, infrastructure spending is highly beneficial, and this is why people become so frustrated when projects seem to stall or get stuck in a never-ending cycle of bureaucracy and consultants. The lack of progress can be seen as a waste of time and resources, especially when compared to places like China, where infrastructure projects seem to be completed much more efficiently. This sense of frustration often causes us to look at countries like China, where infrastructure projects appear to be successful. American roads and bridges are deteriorating, while China is constructing remarkable engineering feats. China has even accomplished the unthinkable by building an entire hospital in just 10 days, whereas the city of San Francisco took 10 years to approve a new bus route. Even long after the initial investment has been made, infrastructure projects can continue to provide significant value. Comment below what you think about China's fast-paced infrastructural developments. Comparing the timelines, it took California 20 years to plan a rail network, while China built the largest one in the world in the same amount of time. Similarly, Sydney spent over 3 billion and more than 4 years to build trams that combine the traffic issues of buses with the inflexibility of trains. It's understandable why people think China's approach to infrastructure is effective, but it's not without its drawbacks. China's high-speed rail network is impressive, but it poses a risk to the Chinese economy that could make Evergrande seem like a minor issue. The reason behind China's fast development of a massive high-speed rail network is the country's large population and the perception of car ownership as a luxury. A well-established rail network became a necessary solution for providing a cost-effective and efficient mode of transportation for people across the country. This demand was not previously presented, as most Chinese workers lived and worked in their hometowns. However, with the countries opening up to the world, more and more young workers moved to the big cities, creating a need for accessible transportation to their families. Before the advent of high-speed rail, workers would spend days or even weeks traveling long distances by bus. By 2008, the Chinese government had already initiated some high-speed rail projects, but the global financial crisis accelerated their efforts. Although China was also affected by the crisis, it was hit harder due to its greater reliance on international trade at the time. During this period, trade intensity plummeted, resulting in a decline in both imports and exports. This was particularly devastating for a country like China, heavily dependent on global trade. In 2008, the global financial crisis caused China to ramp up its efforts on high-speed rail development, which had already been underway. Although the crisis had already had a significant impact on China's trade intensity, causing a decline in both imports and exports, the country responded with fiscal stimulus to counter the blow. However, rather than giving out money without a clear idea of how long the crisis would last, China opted to employ people who had lost their jobs in export markets to build high-speed rail. The approach allowed the country to achieve two goals. It provided employment opportunities for millions of people, and it helped prevent a recession. The Beijing to Shanghai track alone employed over 100,000 workers, and other workers were involved in factories producing steel and cement, delivering materials to the site, and providing goods and services to the workers. However, corruption was a significant issue that plagued the rail program from its inception. Although corruption is common in many government work projects, the scale and visibility of this project made corruption scandals bigger and bolder. This was a significant problem for the government, because it made it difficult to promote the project's accomplishments without being overshadowed by news of officials taking bribes. Moreover, the rail program's problems were compounded in 2011, when two high-speed trains crashed on a section of track that was elevated 20 meters above the ground. 
The Chinese government had already begun working on high-speed rail developments before 2008, but the global financial crisis accelerated these efforts. However, instead of simply providing monetary stimulus, the government decided to put people who might have lost their jobs due to falling trade intensity to work building high-speed rail. This decision proved the wise one, as the rail program provided millions of jobs and helped China avoid going into a recession. However, the project was marred by corruption scandals, which undermined the government's efforts to promote the project as a success. In 2011, a high-speed train collision revealed serious management failures and resulted in public doubts about the safety and integrity of China's high-speed rail infrastructure. The government's solution was to semi-privatize the railways by selling them to state-owned corporation China Rail, which then merged with state-owned corporations CSR and CNR to form CRRC. These corporations borrowed almost a trillion dollars to fund China's railway building boom, but many of the new lines were not as profitable as the earlier ones, and they were built to connect smaller cities with lower demand for train travel. Nevertheless, the government pushed these projects for political reasons, as they wanted to improve access to smaller tier cities. Setting aside misguided political motivations, China's high-speed rail project has faced several issues. The developers failed to consider if there were better alternatives for transporting people across the country, as they were too focused on high-speed rail. Regular rail, for example, is a cheaper alternative that can also transport cargo, which is vital for China's heavy industry. Initially, the overdone high-speed rail network was sustainable as profits from highly profitable routes covered losses from unprofitable ones. The state-owned corporation responsible for the network even managed to make a small profit after paying off its huge debts. However, this balance was disrupted in 2015. Since then, the interest payments on the massive debts have exceeded the profits from operating the rail lines. Several factors have contributed to this, including the aging of the lines, increased maintenance costs, and the inability to raise prices without losing customers to other modes of transport. The COVID pandemic further exacerbated the situation, causing demand for rail tickets to plummet and almost every line to become unprofitable. This has left China with a state-owned enterprise burdened with a debt of $850 billion that it cannot repay. Ironically, this has occurred at a time when fiscal stimulus, like the original high-speed rail development program from 2008, would have been needed again. Of course, it's unlikely that the government will continue to invest in high-speed rail construction. However, they cannot escape the problems created by the current network. If the government tries to sell off the network to pay off the loans, any profit-motivated buyer would only be interested in the profitable routes between major cities, leaving the government to bear the cost of maintaining unprofitable routes with taxpayer money. Alternatively, they could close down the railways, but that would result in significant job losses and tarnish China's image as an economic powerhouse. The last option is a bailout and a return to government ownership of the railway. Despite China's railway being state-owned, it has some independence not afforded to government ministries. All of these options have significant drawbacks, especially during a time when China is facing a housing market crash, energy crisis, and the ongoing pandemic. It's challenging to envision a scenario where China can brush these issues aside. The latest issue with the high-speed rail network is a reminder of why massive infrastructure projects such as railway lines, highways, and bridges require extensive planning and implementation, even in one's own country. That was it for today's video. Hope you enjoyed it. Like, share, and subscribe for more informative videos. Till then, be safe, be alert, and goodbye.